Hey, I'm Rob from Producer Tech, and welcome to episode four of In The Loop, for the latest in music production technology and online learning. This episode, we've got an exclusive interview with Berlin's Chimera, finding out what he's up to and hearing about some of the ways he makes his particular blend of melodic house and techno. I'll be telling you about how I got on with Softube's Console One, a nice bit of kit that gives you hands-on analog style mix processing in the door. I'll be giving you details of our latest remix comp, where you have the opportunity of reworking the fantastic Matthew and the Atlas's Pale Sun Rose for the chance of winning a Focusrite Sapphire Pro 26 audio interface. We'll be checking out some of Plugin Boutique's latest software instruments, and also giving away five copies of their awesome plugin Big Kick, as well as doing a live remix with Machina and lots more. First up then, let's take a look at Console One, which is something I was really keen to try out. Door technology has come on a long way over the years, and especially through the use of software effects that emulate outboard, as well as insert effects that add warmth and other analog artifacts, decent mixing is now totally achievable entirely within software. However, it never hurts to have a bit more analog style processing to help breathe life into an otherwise purely digital mix, and Console One aims to do just that. My only previous contact with Soft2 products was the FET Compressor Reason Rack extension that I reviewed for our channel a while back, which I was really impressed with the quality of, particularly for the price. Console One is an entirely different price bracket, mainly due to the hardware factor, which in this case is a very sturdy metal surface with nice solid knobs, and as you can see, this fits neatly on your desk without taking up too much room, but puts all of the controls that you'd find on one channel of a console right at your fingertips. One thing I only realised after it arrived, however, was that none of the processing actually goes on inside the hardware, so there's no DSP here, and it's purely a control surface for the software. How does it work then? Well, in summary, you insert the Console One plugin on any or all tracks in your project, after which you can type in a name to help identify the track. And there are other buttons for showing all the plugin controls, just in case you maybe don't have the hardware and need to make adjustments, as well as a solo safe button, which means that the plugin's solo function will be deactivated for this instance. So it's recommended for return channels and the master bus. But enough of the boring stuff, let's take a look at it in action now. So if I hit the display button, you can see we get the window popping up. And there's also an auto button on the hardware for making it appear automatically when a control is adjusted. So you can choose what you prefer. So you can see what you get is an SSL 4000 e-console channel strip emulation with a great graphical interface controlled by the hardware surface. And running left to right, you have an input meter and filters, a dynamic shape section, which is a gate or expander, a four band parametric EQ, a compressor, and then an output section, again with a nice big meter featuring an optional drive distortion circuit too. So let's have a listen to it in action. So I've got a very simple live set here with only three tracks in, and I've added console one to all of them, as well as the return tracks and the master. Now I'll open up the console one window. So you can see the tracks in my set running along the bottom here, and I've got the master and return tracks right at the end, which you can set up by clicking on the number in the plugin window, and then pressing the track button on the hardware you want to move that plugin to. So it allows you to configure the setup yourself and keep things easy to find. I can choose the track I want to process using the corresponding track buttons. Starting with the drums then, I'll solo them first. And now I'll turn off the processing, so you can hear each section one by one. So at the start there are the filters. Then there's the shape section, which you can set up as a gate as I've got here, with the threshold set quite high and the release quite short. To make it more extreme, I can hit the hard gate switch, which gives you nice tight control over the dynamics. But what I like even more about this section is the transient shaper, which allows you to boost the initial transient with the punch control and the rest of the envelope with the sustain control, which is great for making the drums fatter as an alternative to using the compressor. Now let's listen to the bass. And on the EQ section then, there are four bands on offer with the two central ones being fully parametric, so with adjustable bandwidths, and the outer two being either shelves, bells, or filters. And the EQ sounds nice and warm generally, and certainly the kind of sound I'd expect from an SSL desk. And similarly, the compressor has that really satisfying classic SSL sound. 
and you can push it nice and hard without the signal deteriorating. Plus, you've got a parallel control, which allows you to blend the dry and wet signals for mixing the compressed and uncompressed sounds together. One of the things I like most about Console One is this drive option on the end, and it's definitely one of the best and most analogue sounding elements about it. Just dialing in a bit adds some really nice saturation, which can be cranked up higher for more extreme effects. And there's a character control which can make it brighter or smoother depending on which way you rotate it. As with other saturators, this driver mount has a compression style effect, and basically limits at high values. So together with the transient shaper, you can create some really sweet effects. Other nice controls you've got here are three switches for changing the order of sections. So you can place the EQ after compression and so on, Two buttons here for selecting multiple tracks, either all of them or a group of tracks, after which you can edit them all at the same time. And the last button here means you can route an external sidechain source from another track in your door to the compressor or shape sections. And as you can see, the hardware has plenty of LEDs for displaying all of your settings and levels. So together with the software's clear GUI, it's nice and obvious what's going on at all times. And of course, with it being software, you can easily copy and paste channel settings around and all sorts of things you'd expect from a digital setup. So you can hear what a huge difference Console 1 makes to all of my tracks here if I disable and then enable them one by one. And on the master, I'm also adding some of the drive feature, with the character control brought down, which is really nice on the master bus, as it makes the distortion softer and less obvious, and smooths out the sound. I've created two bounces of this loop now, one without console one, and one with, and I've normalised them so they're both turned up, and you can really hear what a difference console one makes. So I'm massively looking forward to hearing the difference it can make on my actual mixes, with more digital elements in. I'll be using it shortly to mix two Anarchy Rice tracks I'm currently working on for Kind Crime recordings, so keep an ear out for them to hear the results, which will probably lead to me going into hiding so I don't have to give this demo unit back. Anyway, I've had some great fun with Console One, so if you're looking for some quality analog sounding effects with sweet hands-on control in your door, then it will definitely deliver. Now it's time for this episode's interview, which is with a really nice guy and very talented producer and performer, Chimera. How long have you been in Berlin? I've been here four years now. Cool. And what, what were you doing before then? I was doing the same thing, but in Barcelona oh, nice. for three years. Cool. And then I was in the, before that I was in Costa Rica for a year. Yeah. Um, and then I was just working in some just customer service rubbish. Okay. And before that, I was in Ireland. So I left Ireland in 2006. Nice, yeah. and then you made the move here to work full-time on your music? Well, I had started doing that in Barcelona. So from 2007 till now, I've been doing this full-time. You've just been telling me about two pretty exciting projects by the sounds of things. Uh, yeah. some, both remixes, was it? Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about those? Well, I can tell you about one of them because one of them has been has been confirmed okay. so far. <laughs> the other one's between the two of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I yeah. So I just finished a remix for Moby. Actually, um, I got contacted by his manager about two months ago, and uh, he just had a, a new album that came out at the end of last year. And I think they're doing they're releasing some singles from the album, and they asked me if I wanted to remix one of the tracks. So that was a, a huge honor. Um, 
and it was an absolute um, nightmare <laughs> to do actually because uh, I knew I had like really good source material for the remix but it took such a long time to come together and my way of working is very uh, it, the way that I work is that I tend to I will start something and if it doesn't work after an hour or two yeah. I know that it's not going to work yeah. so I just trash it and I start something new that's a, so. that's a very good tip yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I can't tell people that often enough just yeah. don't keep working at something for hours and, yeah. or days because yeah. it's probably not working if it's, yeah. not, if it's not what you want it to be I mean something like if you know I mean if it starts off there are tracks like that where okay i know this sounds good this bit but it's still it's not quite there and those then do require like you know more work to finish them off obviously but if you don't have or if i don't have some kind of like hook or some kind of something that that kind of reels me in yeah. after working on it for the first few hours then i know it's it's not going to work and i just need to change i need to change my angle of attack you know so with the remix, and with, with remixes in general, the problem is that you can't completely trash everything because you have to start from, from the same place each time. You're starting from the same source material. What made this one a little easier was that there were vocals in it. So as is kind of normal or customary, when you do a, when you do a vocal remix, it's it's acceptable to make your own music around the vocals. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what worked for me. Mm -hmm. So after three or four weeks of like at various failed attempts every single day, mm -hmm. finally on like the last day, and which is also the name of the track, I managed to, <laughs> <laughs> I managed to get something that I really liked. And then it, it came together just like that. Then I mean, from, it took me maybe three or four hours from from start to finish and I got it you know pretty much done and I sent it to them the next day and uh uh thumbs up so I just finished um just finished mixing that so here's a track that I made called uh, Moot Point which came out on Ovum uh in February of this year um this track kind of came together the first thing that I did which I usually do when I when I'm making tracks actually uh, every single track I've ever made has always started with the melody. So I was just messing around on the, the Nord and I always start with, with some kind of loop, uh, with some kind of melodic loop, and then I gradually just change it, chop and change it and, and rearrange it, and it turns into something else. So my usual method of working is actually, surprisingly, I quite often don't play stuff in. I just use the mouse and I click in notes and I move them around until I find something that I like that sounds good. So I just started with this. I think I just probably just threw in a bunch of these notes and this was the first loop. And then I copied it. Start at making little variations, and then shorten the loop. that and I think yeah I put on the fifth chord from uh, it's a chord preset on Ableton and that was it then I ended up with that which is the main 
kind of melodic loop going through the entire track. And I basically built everything then around it. I added in the Moog bass line, again, always with the Moog, which uh, sounds like this. jumped the octave a few times throughout the course of the track. Which is something I do quite often with, with any of my synths that have the option to, to jump the octave. I always like the, the kind of change in, in tone that it, that it gives. It was just a matter of filling in the drums behind it. Drums kind of turned out quite old school. I went, I just had the feeling that it just felt quite, it needed those like snappy 909 uh, snares and claps to kind of really bring it to life. Um, and that was, that was basically how there isn't really a huge amount more in the track. Um, I put in some, just some textures and stuff and some, some extra melodies using the Korg Poly 6, which is one of my favorite VSTs. And I, did, I used it again here. I did, so I did some chords. With all these sounds, which are like the secondary sounds in the track, quite often those kind of come, just kind of pop into my head. So I'm listening to the, to the main melodic loop um, of the track, whatever that happens to be. In this case, it's just a simple synth motif. And I just, I hear extra melodies on top of it. Um, and then I just quickly open up a VST or another synth and I very quickly sketch out those melodies what I'm hearing in my in my head and I add them in to complement the track. If you haven't heard it yet, make sure you check out the very cool, totally improvised 12 minute long jam that Chimera did for our YouTube channel. Now though, time for some very different live electronic music with a rework I did on Machina of a fairly well known track that you might have heard one or two times of late. So first, we'll create a beat with Group A, which is a drum kit with different drums on each pad. So I'll create a new pattern, which will be two bars long, and then record something in. So now that pattern is looping, I'll find the next drum to play. And this time, I'll use the note repeat feature, which plays rolls of notes of whatever speed I choose. Next I'll move on to group B, which I do by pressing the group switches to the left. And you can see the pad colour changes to make it obvious which group I'm now playing. And now the pads are set to keyboard mode, so are being used to play a sound in a similar way to a MIDI keyboard. So now I'll create a pattern for this group and make it four bars long this time, and record in a melodic phrase. Now, moving on to group C, I'll play in some bass. So I'll create a four bar phrase for that too. three groups playing, each with one pattern, which are all looping together. But now I want to create a new section of the song, 
so I need to use Machina's Scenes feature, which allows you to combine different patterns from each group in order to create an arrangement. So what I need to do is create a new scene, and then add my beat pattern to it. And now I'll switch to group D and record in a new part, which is going to be a piano this time. And you can see how chords can be played with the pads as well as single melodic lines. And now I'll create some more melodic parts, like a faster pattern in group G. and a simple strings part in group E. And notice every time you make a pattern or do something in another mode, the studio hardware screens give you a really good display of what's going on. So going back to scenes mode now, I'll duplicate the scene that's playing, but I'm also going to duplicate the drums pattern, because I want to make a change to it, without losing the original pattern. So now I can erase the kick drum from the pattern in this scene. And now to jump back to our first scene with the full drums pattern, bass and so on, I just select that scene, after which it will start playing it when this one finishes. And I'm also going to add the fast pattern in group G to it. And now I'll record in a ride pattern. Now let's go back to our breakdown scene, and I'll show you the pads in one of their other modes, which is where they play back slices of a sample, in this case a 4 bar DNB drum loop I've got loaded into group H, with each pad mapped to one beat of the sample. So you can play the pads consecutively to recreate the sample, or play them in a different order to rearrange it or you can hit the pads in a pretty fast and random fashion to create a crazier pattern. So I'll try recording in a 4 bar pattern now. So with it being so fast, my timing isn't spot on when I'm recording it. But once it plays back, Machina will have corrected those timing issues for me. but I'll mute that for now, and then play the sample in group F, which was the basis for the whole remix. Again, the sample can be played back straight, or in a faster random way, to create cool effects. Now I'll duplicate the scene once again, because I'm going to create a main drop section with our new sounds in, which I'll do by first muting the drums group, then groups B and C, which have nothing in right now, but I'll then add our first main groove patterns to those groups, which we won't hear because they're muted. And then I'll solo the vocal group, so we just hear that, get rid of the piano part from the scene, and then unsolo the vocal to bring everything else back in. So now if we want to jump between each of our scenes much faster than we have been up till now, we can change the timing from a whole scene to a much smaller amount, and then select different scenes by hitting the pads to create some awesome variation and a live mashup effect in our main groove. how to 
to do all of those things and more, you can go to our new site, machina-courses.com, where you'll find complete guides to Machina, which are now fully updated to version 2, courses teaching house and glitch hop, and even a producer's guide to music theory. Courses come with downloadable materials like written notes, bonus samples, and Machina projects, and support is on hand over email or the Produce Tech forum. And if you want to check out any of the courses before signing up, then there are free excerpts embedded on the course pages. Plus, as a special offer in this episode, you can click on the C button on any of the course pages and then use the code ITLEP420 to get 20% of all courses on the site for a limited time. And now, some information about our latest remix contest, which is something a bit different this time. So, not a dance track, but an acoustic one of the alternative folk variety. To mix things up a bit, no pun intended, and to provide some really nice stems for the Produce Tech community, we're offering you the chance to remix the lush track Pale Sun Rose by Matthew and the Atlas. Not only is this a great track, but it was produced by none other than Ian Grimble, a bit of a legend in the audio industry, whose credits over the last 40 years include Manic Street Preachers, Travis, Everything But The Girl, and loads more. To enter the competition, visit the Producer Tech Facebook page and then click on the link in the Remix Comp post. Or click on the link on our homepage, producertech.com, which takes you to the forum thread with full instructions, including a link to the app where you can download the stems. All entries should be posted on the thread before the end of July, after which the winning tracks will be picked by band frontman Matthew Hegarty himself. First prize is a Focusrite Sapphire Pro 26 audio interface, five Loopmaster sample packs, and two Producer Tech courses and a feature in the Communion Records newsletter. And three runners-up all get a course and sample pack too. So some great stems to work with there, which I encourage you all to try having a go at. And best of luck to everyone who enters. Now let's look at some tasty plugins, which have recently become available on the Plugin Boutique website. For any of you that don't know Plugin Boutique yet, it's a one-stop shop for all your plugins, with all the best manufacturers in one place. You can watch videos, read reviews, download demo trials, and everything is rated by customers. There's also loads of free plugins to download. And with every plugin you purchase, you get virtual cash that earns you discount off your next purchase. And you have an account where you can store all of your downloads along with their licenses and serials. So in other words, it's awesome. Plus, they've now started bringing out their own plugins. The first one is Big Kick, which put simply is a must have for any producer. It allows you to craft your own huge kicks through a combination of sample and synthesis techniques. In a nutshell, you combine an attack section, which is the kick sample, that adds the main unique character element and punchy initial hit of the drum, with a body section that provides a totally customizable low frequency tone, which can be shaped and tuned any way you want. Then you can mix and process these two elements with a load of extra features to further fatten or clean the sound up. The next plugin is Zampler, which is a simple sampler plugin that comes with heaps of samples from the extensive Loopmasters library, including main room and EDM drums and dance production sound banks. So it can work in any combination of single or multi sample modes, after which samples can be processed by various modulators like the three LFOs and envelopes, as well as a nice little effects section. You can find my lengthier guides to both of these plugins on the Plugin Boutique site. Zampler is actually a free plugin so you can just head on over to pluginbt.com to download that. But we've been kindly provided with five copies of Big Kick to give away. So here's details of how you can get your hands on one of those. To show you what Big Kick can do and give you some more free stuff in appreciation of your support, you can visit our SoundCloud page to listen to and download a bank of free tuned kicks, which are a gift from Producer Tech that you can get hold of as presets, which you can load up in Big Kick or just in audio format. Before the next episode, we'll select five followers of the Produce Tech SoundCloud page at random to win a copy of Big Kick. So just hit that follow button to enter the competition. And lastly, well done to Elliot Short, who won the competition from our last episode by correctly answering the question about Focusrite owner Phil Dudderidge, who was the former live sound man for the legendary Led Zeppelin. So that's it for this episode. Tune in next time for more tutorials, reviews, interviews, competitions, and other audio-related bananas. This has been In The Loop from Producer Tech. Thanks for watching and see you next time.